Greetings, I'm Richard Buse, and it's good to be with you. We are turning to the Bible and to Luke's Gospel and chapter 15 and Jesus' story of the materialistic young man who set out to have a good time in life and had to settle for a good deal less. It begins verse 12 here with the boy's request to his father. Father, give me my share of the estate. You know, that summed him up. Give me. That's it. Travelling in Africa once, I acquired from a citizen of Zimbabwe a banknote issued by that country, and I've blown it up a little bit on the computer for you to have a look at. It is a banknote for no less than $25 billion. I said to my companion, how much is that worth? Oh, he said, uh, could be 20 cents in America and uh, 10 pence in England. He said it might buy a loaf of bread in Zimbabwe, assuming that there was bread to be had. So, pay the bearer, on demand, $25 billion. You don't get promises much flimsier than that. Though Jesus Christ once said that what shall it profit a person to gain the whole world and lose their own soul? So that that could be the worst deal of all, to lose your own irreplaceable self. Here in this story, the young man wants to be not a contributor to life, he wants to be a consumer. And there it is in just two words of verse 12. Give me, give me my share of the estate. I'm sick of home, you're saying. I'm going to make my mark. I am out on my own now. And his dad lets him go. The main emphasis that comes across to me here is not so much on the adventures of the son as on the unwavering attitude of the father who is Jesus' portrait of the undying love of God. Will God let a man or woman go who doesn't want his love and protection, even though it is he who gave us life in the first place? Yes. We are made for God, but our relationship with him has to be one of love and of gratitude. Otherwise, we're no more than puppets on a string or we're just programmed robots. God himself will never beat a person into a submission. We had an old TV set at home when I was leading the work at All Souls Church in Langham Place, London. And that old TV set, it would only, we got to the point when it would only work if it was hit. Well, there's nothing of the big stick about God. There is such a thing as free human agency. And if we choose to go our own way, God will let us go. I'm off, announces the son to the father. Give me what will be mine. I want it now. And presently, he is a diminishing dot on the winding road that leads away from home. He's sick of home, and now he's in an environment where you can live as you please. You and I can get like that, mentally, when the big issues of life and eternity are forced off the screen of our minds by the pressures, or maybe the pleasures, of modern living. And to all intents and purposes, we can end up as practical atheists, I remember taking the funeral of a man some years ago and I said to his, uh, his wife a few days beforehand, tell me about, let's call him Fred, tell me about Fred. Oh, she said, to Fred, life was one jolly good binge. That was his epitaph. Well, here's a young man in the story who is out on a binge with money in the bank and a period of what Luke chapter 15 describes as wild living. He was sick of home and it was good to be free. However, it wasn't too long before he became homesick. One way or another, life was ceasing to satisfy. It's such a common pattern that we ought not really to be too surprised at its occurrence. But how slow we are to learn. BBC television a while back was featuring the story of Lord Byron, one of the greatest of all English romantic poets 200 years ago. Lord Byron, who set his heart on possessing every sensual experience going. He once described his own case in the following words. Drank every cup of joy, heard every trump of fame, drank early, deeply drank, drank draughts which common millions might have drunk, then died of thirst because there was no more to drink. That's Lord Byron. In the case of Luke 15 here, one way or another, the flow of money had dried up. The $25 billion 
had dipped in value to 20 cents. Then a famine set in and before long we see our hero lucky enough to get a job feeding pigs but then hungry also to the point where he's dipping into the pig swill in order to be able to survive at all. He's on his chin straps and is far from home. Friends, all around the cities of our world we see homelessness. What is it? Homelessness is the collapse of someone's world. On the spiritual level, that is our human predicament outside of a relationship with God in Jesus Christ. Without a personal knowledge of God and of his son Jesus Christ in our lives, we have a collapsed worldview. We can wake up in the morning and eat, work, eat, work, eat, work, go home, watch the news on the television, get, go to bed. At the end of our lives, yeah, I have a few kind words said on our behalf and maybe get our names into the local papers for just one more time. But ask us to give an account of who we are or where we're from or what life is all about and what this universe is for and where we're all heading. Well, we're pushed for an answer because spiritually, in our inner being, we have no true and lasting centre. So this parable of Jesus has stabbed itself into the consciousness and conscience of millions of people. We read here then that the young man at last came to his senses. It's strange, but, well, no, perhaps it's not strange, that very often it's some unforeseen disaster that propels an individual to wake up to true reality and to start on the quest home. It happened to my own grandfather, actually. My grandfather on my mother's side, Oscar Berry, was his name, and he was big in the city. He was master of the Fan Makers Guild in London. Then one day, while on holiday in France, he received an urgent summons. Come back at once. There's been a financial crash in the city. You've lost everything. Grandpa was not a prodigal. He was an extremely honest and upright pillar of society and had always attended church every Sunday. But he'd been a Christian only in name, really, going through the motions of church life. But without a personal knowledge of Jesus Christ, what happened? What had happened was that the, the disaster brought him to his senses, spiritually. One day he said to my saintly grandmother, Nelly, I'm worried about my soul. She was very wise and said, why not go down the road to see the vicar there, the minister? He'll help you. Sure enough, he did. The vicar led him to a simple, trusting faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the first time. And he told my grandpa of how Christ had died for his sins upon the cross, accepting in his own person there the responsibility, the penalty for the sins that would otherwise shut us out of heaven forever. He told my grandfather to become a real Christian. He didn't have to do anything beyond thanking Jesus Christ for what he had done at the cross, telling him that he was sorry for keeping him at arm's length all those many years, and then simply opening the door of his life to Jesus in an act of the will. Come into my life, Jesus Christ. I'm your faithful follower from now on. Spiritually, Grandpa had come to his senses and came home. Well, all that is pictured in the parable of Luke 15. There it is, verse 18. In his dire predicament, the young man remembers better days and resolves to get home again. So there were three phases that he went through. Sick of home, homesick, home. What a homecoming. This is a picture of God, ladies and gentlemen. The Father, in his own yearning to see men and women, girls and boys, being established in a relationship with himself through trust in Jesus Christ. You can see that Father out on the rooftop, day after day, gazing into the distance. I wonder if my son is coming home today. Could it be today? Must it be tomorrow? And then he wonders for it to himself, and one day he sees a tiny speck in the distance coming towards him. There it is. But that's a shambles of a man. That's a person in wreck. It can't be my son. It is his son. The father is now out on the road himself. Doesn't he want to wait, arms folded, waiting for the boy to make his own way back and explain his obdurate behaviour? No, not one little bit. The father is out there running, running, running towards his son. And friends, this is a picture of God in Jesus Christ. He has eyes for you and me. He's had eyes for us from eternity. 
Christ came and died on the cross in order to come out and meet us and reclaim us and bring us home. When it happens, there are no recriminations, no post-mortems, nothing like that. Several times in Luke chapter 15, Jesus says that there is joy in heaven over just one person who turns around and comes back home to God. Well, if Jesus says it, I can believe it. The bedraggled son, tottering home, is ready enough to give a personal explanation of his wild living. He even wants to say, I see in verse 19, he wants to say, you won't want to call me your son anymore, of course, Dad, but perhaps you could make me just as one of your hard servants, just to help around the house a bit. But his dad sweeps all that aside. Blow up some balloons. Switch on the lights. Bring in the neighbours. We are going to have a party. This is Jesus' story. The point is very clear. Heaven goes mad when you and I stumble home, dishevelled, second-hand, sin-laden, and join God's family. It's best not to delay over the issue. Let's not wait for the crisis, as my grandfather did. A man once said to me, maybe I'll have a deathbed repentance. My reply was, I don't think you will. By the time you and I are on our deathbeds, I said, we shall be so pumped full of drugs that we'll be in no position to decide what to have for breakfast, let alone how to spend eternity. No, the moment to decide is in the here and now. My dad, who was a preacher, was once explaining this issue in a church service in Tunbridge in Kent. He said, as we get older, we find it harder and harder to make these great decisions about God because, he says, we find it less personally convenient to change around things. And he added, not many people accept Jesus Christ into their lives after the age of 50. Well, later that day, a man came to see my dad and he said, I want you to know that today, I have accepted Christ into my life and I've become a real Christian. Dad congratulated him and shook his hand and then said, that's wonderful news. What prompted you to take that step? Oh, he said, I'm 50 tomorrow. Well, we can ask ourselves, how long has the Father God been waiting for us to come to him? You may know that story, the Chinese fable of the traveler in the desert. Hungry, thirsty, baking heat above, and finally spies in the far distance an oak tree with shady leaves and he goes up to it, finally sinks under its branches. Ah, oh, he said, how lucky I am to have found you. Luck, said the oak tree. It's not luck. I've been waiting for you for 400 years. For someone listening right now, it's been long enough. God has been waiting for us. What a change around happens when we do make the great decision. The story of this passage began with a self-centered demand, give me. The turnaround came with the words that are really like a prayer, oh, make me, make me. Let this be such a decision between us and God in Jesus Christ. And when you've made it, write in and tell us about it. God bless you always.